Hello, my name's Catherine and I'm part of the archive team at the M&S Company Archive in Leeds. Welcome to our special festive online talk, Magic and Sparkle M&S at Christmas. This is a light-hearted look at the traditions, products and marketing that have defined Christmas trading at M&S since we began life as a humble penny bazaar market stall in Leeds in 1884. This is a pre-recorded talk, but I'm available online now to answer any questions and you're always welcome to get in touch with the archive at any time too. We're sharing quite a few of our archive images with you as part of this talk, but if you'd like to use any of the images or content in any other way, please get in touch with us. Having started in 1884 and expanded through the 1890s and into the 1900s, we know that up until the First World War, we would have been selling mainly household and haberdashery goods. But known Christmas goods that we sold during this time included Christmas candles, small Christmas ornaments and sheet music albums of Christmas carols. Not specific to Christmas, our penny bazaars also sold small toys like pipe cleaner dolls, slates and chalks, miniature tea sets and brightly painted wooden yo-yos, which would doubtless have been very popular at Christmas. We also sold household goods like lace doilies, which people would have used for the Christmas dinner table. And this 1907 image of our Newport Arcade Penny Bazaar gives an idea of how we presented our market stalls for the Christmas trading period with paper festoons, which would no doubt have been in very bright colours to showcase the range of goods available. We can trace our history of Christmas trading right back to our early period and this is one of the earliest examples of Christmas marketing that we have in the archive collection from our grand annual, which was an M&S produced magazine that featured fiction, um, articles and product adverts, not just for items that we sold in our penny bazaars, but for other famous brand names too. And this 1909 um, edition of the M&S grand annual includes an advert for Christmas decorations um, and you can send a postal order to Marks and Spencer to receive a box through the post containing a whole set of Christmas decorations, um, paper festoons in assorted colours and shapes, paper balls, folding screen fans and um, everything you need to decorate for the Christmas season. This is another advert for the same product that featured in the same edition of the Grand Annual, but this time featuring different details and a different illustration. And it's quite interesting how the advert describes the delightful and ever increasing use of the Christmas tree for children's parties and schools, and that that has induced Marks and Spencer to offer this splendid parcel of decorative material. Um, and it talks about tinsel, garlands and jewels and ornaments. Um, you could also scale up the size of the decoration parcel that you received. So the smallest parcel was at five shillings um, and then it was also available at 10 shillings and 20 shillings um, with double and quadruple the um, amount of quantity contained within it. But that's not the only time that the illustration features in the archive collection. Our packaging design team used the same illustration as the inspiration for a 2008 festive biscuit tin. So it's a design and an illustration that's continued um, to feature in our Christmas products. Staying with the idea of Christmas decorations, this advert from the 1912 Grand Annual winter edition um, shows that we were advertising paper garlands, festoons, coloured bells and screen fans all at one penny each. And I particularly like the wording in the middle that these decorations are for parties, public festivities, balls, cinderellas and conversaciones. Very grand. 
From the same year, 1912, comes this advert for the range of children's toys available at our penny bazaars, all priced at one penny each. And the illustration includes teddy bears, simple musical instruments, bats, dolls, a small sailing boat, toy trains, dominoes, and even what looks like a punch puppet. And it's quite interesting that 110 years later, many of these items would still be recognisable to children now. Another of the types of products that were very popular at our penny bazaars in the 1910s was sheet music. At a time when pianos often featured in community locations like church halls, social clubs and pubs, our sheet music series covered traditional hymns, popular tunes and folk songs. And during the First World War, it included patriotic music, such as the national anthems of the Allied forces. And for Christmas, unsurprisingly, we produced sheet music for Christmas carols. These often featured lovely front cover designs such as these. And many of the carols they contained remain very familiar to us now. This particular edition includes While Shepherds Watched, Hark the Herald Angels Sing and Once in Royal David City. But there are others that are far less well known today. I'm afraid I don't recognise Saw You Never in the Twilight or Nigh 2000 Years Ago or Here We Come Our Sailing. I do happen to know that some of these popular Victorian tunes are still sung by choirs today. For example, I've sung Hail Smiling Morn in a choir. I remember it because it had some very challenging high notes. This photograph is a little later. This was taken in November of 1925 and it shows our Croydon Marks and Spencer store. So by this point we had moved into small shops rather than trading from market stalls. And you'll see that the upper story of the store has been specially decorated as the Father Christmas storehouse, uh, encouraging people to come in uh, and see the Christmas goods on offer. This image shows our Leeds store in 1933. And because of the lights that were part of the shop fittings, it's, it's very difficult to see the detail of some of the products on offer here, but you can definitely see the, um, the paper decorations throughout the store and the sign showing the way downstairs for toys, games, Christmas cards and novelties. Also from the 1930s, this stylish illustration featured on the front cover of the Marks and Spencer magazine, which was a publication we produced for our customers. And this is the front cover from the Christmas 1932 edition. This archive image is one of the favourites of the archive team. Uh, we, we tend to use this quite heavily at, at Christmas time for all the, the different activities or resources that we're producing. And from a couple of years later in 1934, this front cover of an MS colleague magazine shows a very traditional um, fireside Christmas scene. It looks very, very tempting and very cosy. This 1932 advert shows a range of the Christmas products we were offering, including chemical and electrical sets, a conjuring set and the actor's outfit which features costume props for the keen amateur dramatic performer. It includes grease paints and hair moustaches. Um, the advert also shows an illustration of a table tennis set, which enables you to convert any table into a games table for table tennis. And we actually have a surviving example of this particular product in the archive collection. Another insight into M&S at Christmas time that we get for the 1930s from the archive collection is a, a look at what life was like for M&S colleagues. In the 1930s, it became standard for our store teams and our office teams to have special Christmas parties. 
And this photograph we know is from sometime in the 1930s, taken at Chatham and showing m and colleagues um, in their finery for their Christmas celebration. And this is the same set of colleagues from Chatham Star, but at a different Christmas party from the same period. They obviously did like their festive get togethers. The 1940s was dominated by the Second World War. Many of our colleagues joined the armed services and each Christmas during the wartime period, we received many Christmas cards from M&S servicemen from around the world, such as these, all kept in a special album at head office and now part of the archive collection. We also kept in touch with serving M&S employees by sending them a weekly forces bulletin which would include company updates. By 1944, the personnel department at m and were able to produce a slim newsletter designed to be air-mailed out and to use the minimum amount of paper. On the home front, shortages and rationing limited the range of goods that were available in our stores, and by 1944, restrictions were clearly taking their toll. One edition of the Weekly Forces Bulletin described how limited the toy department was, explaining that the children had a very lean Christmas. But this 1945 photograph of our London Marble Arch Stores toy department shows a better range of gifts available. And for the same year, 1945, we have this Christmas dinner menu from the Blackpool store team's Christmas celebration. It's entitled A Victory Christmas Dinner and it sounds delicious, featuring a lot of the traditional Christmas foods that we would expect and hope for. But this must have been quite difficult to produce given the rationing that was in place at the time. This photograph shows the Gloucester store team sitting down for the staff Christmas dinner in 1946. So the war was over, but a lot of the restrictions were still in place. And you can see that the Christmas party is happening on the shop floor. The rails of clothing have been pushed to the side to make space for the tables. And it's clearly on quite a different scale to the very glamorous parties that were held in the 1930s. But the Gloucester Star obviously knew how to celebrate in style. This is from their Christmas party the following year in 1947 and clearly involves some amateur dramatics. Jumping ahead a little further, this is a cracker display from one of our stores in the 1950s. Rumours that Christmas crackers today are still using the same jokes as they were in the 1950s have not been substantiated by the archive team's research. While this artistically arranged window display is showcasing the wide range of gloves available in our store as the perfect gift for Christmas. Our specialist teams of window dressers changed the displays on a daily basis in many cases to showcase the um, next range of products as decided by the store manager. And we tended not to use mannequins and models at this period, but our window dressers were very adept at using wire and um, stuffing to produce animation effects. Um, in this case, the gloves appear to be floating through the air places. Um, and it really was important that our store windows showcase the best of our goods to entice customers into our stores. Those store windows really were a key form of advertising. This marketing image from the 1950s gives further insight into the toys that were available. It was part of a feature called Toys to Dream About, and many of these items would have appeared on children's uh, letters to Father Christmas. As well as the cuddly toys, you'll also spot some recognisable cartoon characters. We have Noddy and Donald Duck. And just to the right of the image, you might just be able to make out the um, St. Michael table tennis box. So the box set of table tennis, still a popular gift right into the 1950s. Remember that we first saw it in the 1930s. Now, obviously a traditional Christmas favorite is Christmas pudding. 
This originated in the 14th century as a porridge called frumenty that was made of beef and mutton with raisins, currants, prunes, wines and spices. By the very late 1500s, it had changed into more of a plum pudding, thickened with eggs, breadcrumbs and dried fruit, and given even more flavour with the addition of beer and spirits. It became the customary Christmas dessert around 1650, but then in 1664 it was banned by the Puritans. It was King George I who re-established Christmas pudding as part of the Christmas meal. And by Victorian times, Christmas puddings had changed into something far more similar to the ones that are eaten today. There's a reference in the Marks and Spencer Grand Annual for 1912 to plum pudding, which is included in a section called Christmas Customs. But we weren't selling Christmas puddings at that time, However, we were selling baking tins and kitchen utensils as seen in this grand annual advertisement. The next reference to Christmas puddings is from the 1932 edition of the Marks and Spencer magazine, including practical recipes and it features a good Christmas pudding. There's also a recipe for an alcohol free teetotalers pudding, which noticeably isn't described as good. Other recipes featuring in this selection of practical recipes include creamed fish, potato cakes, scotch bloaters and stewed liver and bacon. And you'll see that the article features the dark threat that she who neglects her cookery book may well lose her husband. In 1958, we start selling Christmas puddings on a trial basis at a cost of two shillings and sixpence. And the two packaging images here show how our Christmas puddings were presented to customers in the late 1950s, which is the higher of the two images, and in the lower image, the 1960s. This 1960s pudding was actually donated to the archive collection, fully intact and unopened, complete with the pudding. In 1976, we started to sell a three pound Christmas pudding for families with hearty appetites, priced at £1.99, and the microwavable Christmas pudding was introduced in November 1987. It was described as the six minute Christmas pud. There was also a two pound Christmas pudding which could cook in the microwave. Today our Christmas puddings cater for all different diets and tastes. Another classic festive food tradition is of course Christmas cake. In 1954, we introduced our customers to try a shop-bought M&S Christmas cake and ice it at home. This was one of the first steps we took in a gradual process to persuade customers that shop-bought cakes from M&S could be just as delicious as home-baked cakes, which were seen as far superior in quality up until this point. And there was quite a snobbery about serving homemade rather than shop-bought cake. It wasn't until 1982 that we trialled a fully iced Christmas cake for the first time. And in 2012, I found the details that our Christmas cake production involved sultanas, raisins, currants, cherries and peel to a total of 541 tonnes. We used 99 tonnes of butter and 98 tonnes of eggs. Of course, it wouldn't be Christmas without mince pies too. We first introduced mince pies in 1958 as a trial in selected stores, um, selling a pack of four mince pies for one shillings and two pence. And the trial was obviously successful because the following year we were selling mince pies in all of our stores. And then the next year, 1960, we even introduced the family mince pie, a giant pie for the whole family to enjoy at Christmas. In 1961, our mince pies were very much marketed at the family wanting a good quality but very convenient Christmas. And the top image here shows 1960s mince pie food packaging design. Um, the archive contains quite an interesting uh, item in a, a, one of our staff magazines. In 1969, the Liverpool m store received a letter in the post from a British captain working in South America, praising the flavour and quality of m mince pies that he had had specially shipped over. 
1976, mince pies proved to be a very popular product um, at just 39 pence for six, um, obviously shortly after they moved to um, decimalisation, um, available in either sharp crust or puff pastry. And um, one of the 1977 staff magazines features this article shown on the lower left, um, it, explaining the quality of the ingredients used in our mince pies and the exclusive spice mix that we used. In 1981, we introduced an open top star topped mince pie for the first time. And in the mid 1980s, we introduced a wholemeal pastry mince pie as well. Our connoisseur Christmas mince pies launched in the mid 1990s. And in 1995, we introduced for the first time mince pies suitable for vegetarians made with vegetable rather than animal suet. And we've even got some um, statistics showing that in the mid 1990s, um, from when we first started selling mince pies in 1958 through to mid 1990s, our estimate was, was that we'd sold 2 billion mince pies. From the late 1960s onwards, we started to focus on the idea of convenience and especially party food um, so that everyone could be the hostess with the mostess with a range of pre-prepared party special foods. These included sausage rolls, pork pies, chipolatas on sticks and trifles. In 1973, we launched some new confectionery lines, including chocolate covered ginger and Turkish delight. And in 1976, we offered frozen and fresh turkeys available in weights ranging from six pounds to a whopping 15 pounds. The big trend that we start to see increasing from the 1980s onwards is really trying to make Christmas entertaining much easier for customers. Now, this appeared in a, one of our 1980s staff magazines, a frankly terrifying countdown to Christmas dinner, which uh, presents it as planning a military operation, but all designed to make things as easy as possible for customers. And other 1980s articles like this one for carefree Christmas cooking, we're trying to take the um, stress and anxiety out of festive entertaining for our customers. So this year, instead of slaving for hours in a hot, steamy kitchen, be pre-prepared. With clever planning beforehand and clever use of St. Michael festive foods, the nail biting is eased, leaving plenty of time to join in the fun. In 1982, we introduced a Christmas turkey ordering service and our first Christmas hamper. And this is one of our very earliest Christmas gift packs containing an iced fruit cake, an assortment of chocolates, a Christmas pudding, some biscuits, assorted nuts, a tin of cooked ham and the all important sherry and Liebfrau milk. One of the key marketing ideas that comes through very strongly in our marketing from the 1950s onwards is the idea of Marks and Spencer being for a family Christmas and the presentation of an idealised family group, quite often featuring attractive festive knitwear. Also with ideas for gifts for family members and how to decorate your home and how to have your own family traditions. We also see the idea of the Christmas jumper in the 1960s onwards, and obviously that's something that many of us are very familiar with today. Many of the advertising images showcase the idea of a perfect Christmas at home, all featuring items available in our stores, whether it's toys and gifts or cosy clothing. This 1970s marketing image highlights m and evening wear that is perfect for the festive season. So for him, we have a smart velvet blazer and bow tie and a very striking caftan style evening gown for her. Um, and they are so enjoying the festive flirting that they haven't even noticed who's creeping up the stairs. Um, we actually have this caftan gown in the archive collection 
Um, and it's quite unusual that we have both the marketing image from when a product was available and the merchandise itself and the, the garment itself in the archive collection. So it's quite a nice example to show. And then moving into the 1980s, our festive party wear ranges featured bold fuchsias and electric blues, which were popular in the period and featured shoulder pads, very influenced by Dallas and Dynasty style dressing. It wasn't just specific products or garments that featured in this kind of Christmas marketing. This 1976 advert showcases our newly introduced MS gift vouchers in a feature called It's Prezi Time. While this internal Christmas card design from 1985 is a tongue-in-cheek look at one of the latest innovations for our customers, the Marks & Spencer Charge Card. Our charity Christmas cards were introduced in the 1990s and this 1996 leaflet includes details of Christmas cards available through our home delivery service. In the run-up to Christmas in 1999, we offered customers extra special gifts as part of Millennium Celebrations. And we also introduced an online shopping offer to our website for the first time with a limited range of just 200 products sold in time for Christmas 1999. 20 years later, our website features thousands of products and our entire food range of more than 5,000 items is available via Ocado. Although one particular nod to our past this year is that a higher volume of festive purchases than normal will probably be reaching customers by post, which makes me think back to the postal order service for boxes of our Christmas decorations right back in 1909. Moving on to the 2000s, in 2000 itself, our Christmas food ordering service was introduced enabling customers to place and collect orders in store. And in 2001, we started to use the magic and sparkle tagline for the first time in our Christmas adverts. And the magic and sparkle slogan was new, used numerous times from here onwards. And it appeared again in 2014 in our Christmas TV advert campaign, introducing customers to two special Christmas fairies named Magic and, you've guessed it, Sparkle. In 2005, we started to work with housing and homelessness charity Shelter for our Shelter Festive Sandwich Collection. We donate 5% of every sale to help fund calls answered by Shelter over Christmas. And over a period of 12 years, we raised £2.8 million through the sale of the festive food on the Move range. That's not the only significant Christmas sandwich development at M&S. In 2012, we launched a three course Christmas dinner sandwich. And it was last year in January 2019 that we launched our vegan plant kitchen range, which at Christmas time included special vegan Christmas fare for the first time for our customers. Um, it included plant protein based centerpieces, vegetables, uh, roast potatoes, gravy, stuffing, and even no pigs in duvets, a plant protein pig in blankets. This is last year's food advert for Christmas, but given the dramatic developments of 2020, the bustling food market already feels like a lifetime ago. Now this is Christmas. Oh and that brings us bang up to date with Christmas 2020. Within the retail sector, the weeks in the run up to Christmas are often referred to as the golden quarter or peak and represent when retailers are at their busiest and do a significant proportion of their annual trade compressed within just a few weeks. The same applies this year, of course, but within the business this year, we're calling it not just peak, but a unique peak, recognising the additional challenges that trading within the pandemic means. Thank you for joining this event. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with the archive team. And our next event is on the 19th of February, and it's looking at Vintage M&S, an introduction to our fashion archive. We hope you'll join us then.